about uh, this artist, Helen Franken Pollard. And um, so here we see her uh, pictured uh, in her studio from a Life magazine uh, cover that I think uh, was done in 1953. Um, but I, I wanted to start off with this quote by Frankenthaler that I think is kind of a, a good way of framing our discussion of her work today. Uh, the only rule is that there are no rules. Um, so what we're going to consider today is how Helen Frankenthaler came to be a rule breaker and um, who influenced her along the way and who she in turn influenced in the way that she broke rules in the way she um, made her art. And so our um, discussion today uh, is part of a kind of a series of Art Afternoon programs this semester that's focusing on abstract expressionist art. Um, and so here we go. Um, here is a, a later photo of Helen Frankenthaler, uh, and again, kind of uh, expanding on this quote about uh, there are no rules. Uh, and she says, that is how art is born, how breakthroughs happen. Go against the rules or ignore the rules. That is what invention is about. Uh, so I wanted to think about you know, specifically what kinds of uh, things did uh, Frankenthaler uh, sort of do that was innovative and how did she break rules in terms of painting. We look at a couple of the of photographs of Frankenthaler working. I think we can start to see uh, first off how she broke a major rule of painting prior to this time. Um, and this is a, these are later photographs of her in 1969. Um, but um, of course, we see Helen Frankenthaler here not working at an easel, but instead working on the floor, having her canvas spread out onto the floor and um, working um, in that manner. It also gives a sense of how she's applying the paint, not with brushes, uh, as again was tradition, uh, but pouring paint that had been thinned down considerably uh, directly from cans and working oftentimes not with brushes, but with uh, painting pads and wipers and, and different kinds of utensils that, uh, or tools that allow her to spread this very thin down paint onto her unprimed canvas uh, and uh, allowed it to soak directly into that unprimed canvas. Uh, and here's a, another image of her uh, working in, and a quote from a 1971 interview uh, with Cindy Nemser, uh, where she said, I generally work with the canvas on the floor and from pails of paint. I usually don't like to work over pictures because very often what I want to accomplish in the picture can't be experienced by worrying the canvas, reworking, salvaging. I try never to let the event and the result become a beautiful trap. So, you know, for Frankenthaler, uh, she liked to have her paintings look as if they were uh, kind of created in a, in a single moment, uh, that they hadn't uh, been labored over or reworked, as she uh, puts it, uh, by worrying the canvas. And of course, part of the reason um, she did not work in this way is the fact that her paint, since it was thinned down, and soaking directly into that unprimed canvas, it's very much like a watercolor. If anybody's painted watercolors, you know that you know, the paint immediately soaks into that paper and you really can't change it that much. Uh, and so that's in many ways how she was uh, working uh, in her uh, painting. Franklin Dollar's breakthrough came when she was just shy of 24 years old with this painting called Mountains and Sea from 1952. Uh, when it was exhibited, uh, Frankenthaler became uh, very well known within the, the art world. Uh, and uh, this painting is now part of the National Gallery of Arts collection in Washington, D.C. But part of, again, what, what was such a breakthrough for Mountains and Sea was that this was really the first time that she introduced this technique of working uh, on unprepared canvas, 
uh, and working with these heavily diluted paints that soak directly into the canvas. Uh, and this method became known as soak stain. And it was something that was used by Jackson Pollock and, and many other artists, uh, but really seems to have been uh, invented or, or introduced uh, by Frankenthaler. And so, uh, like I said, you know, here she is, you know, not even 24 years old, and she um, makes this breakthrough painting that really, in many ways, put her on the map uh, in terms of the history of art at a very young age. The painting that uh, inspired today's talk is this one. It is on display out in the Sandy Bell Gallery. So if you were just out and listening to the concert, it was directly uh, behind me, the uh, musicians there. Uh, and it is called Head of the Meadow from 1967. Uh, and it's on loan to the museum. Uh, we think through the end of October. Uh, so it's not part of our collection, but wanted to um, have a little talk about it while it's still here uh, in our midst. Um, and so here, this painting is done uh, in 67, so over a decade after her breakthrough painting of Mountains and Sea. But it still employs that same soak stain technique. Uh, the, the major difference is she's using acrylic paint um, at this point, instead of oil, as she was uh, doing with um, Mountains and Sea. And as we can see from both of these paintings, Mountains uh, and Sea and Head of the Meadow, her titles often allude to nature, but these are not landscape paintings in, in a traditional sense. So again, kind of breaking some of those rules um, of tradition. It's, it's really through the color that we get a sense of uh, a landscape uh, in reference to that landscape through the, the color of the sky, the, uh, the color of you know, grass and maybe uh, flowers in, in the meadow uh, that uh, she refers to in the title, Head of the Meadow. But I wanted to think today about how Frankenthaler came to, to be a, a rule breaker and to have such a breakthrough painting at such an early age uh, with Mountains and Sea. Uh, and um, so, in many ways, her path began um, as a child. Um, she was uh, born into a, a wealthy family um, and, uh, in New York, and uh, her father was um, a New York State Supreme Court Justice um, who died when she was 11. And um, so, but her family had always encouraged all three of the girls to um, to really think for themselves and to, uh, they encouraged uh, uh, Frankenthaler's uh, artistic ability from an early age. Um, and she said, you know, my father believed I was special from the day I was born, and so I believed it too. Uh, and so she came to um, kind of have this um, attitude towards uh, education largely through her family that was very progressive. She uh, uh, graduated from high school from the Dalton School um, uh, a very progressive uh, private uh, prep school um, in New York. You can see from the, the map here that I've included that you know, the address is, is rather prestigious. Um, and um, near Park Avenue, um, and Madison Avenue. Um, so this is, a, this is a school that was founded by uh, a woman who had been uh, heavily influenced by the Montessori method. Uh, and so um, a very, uh, important educational experience early on in her uh, career. Uh, the motto of the school, I think, could, could also be the motto of Helen Frankenthaler, go forth unafraid. Um, and so it was kind of in this atmosphere that she was nurtured artistically uh, as a, a high school student. She graduated from Dalton in 1945. And while she was at Dalton, she had the wonderful opportunity to study with this artist, uh, Rufino Tamayo. Uh, a Mexican artist often associated with uh, murals, uh, as we see here, uh, this one in Mexico City. Uh, and uh, here's a, a work, uh, a somewhat earlier work uh, from 1944, about the time that Frankenthaler would have been studying uh, with Tamaya. Um, and um, you can see that uh, he was very influenced by um, some of the ideas of European modernism, in particular, um, cubism and um, some of the uh, sense of abstraction uh, that uh, came out of 
European modernism. So uh, here he is teaching at uh, the Dalton School and uh, was really the first um, teacher of art that Helen Frankenthaler had. Uh, I wanted to just quickly show you, if you're familiar with the museum's collection, this was on display not that long ago. This is uh, a Tamayo uh, lithograph that the museum has in its permanent collection. It's not on display right now, but it has been recently. Uh, Frankenthaler decided while she was at the Dalton School that she wanted to study art, and she went on to another progressive uh, school, the Liberal Arts College at Bennington College uh, in uh, Bennington, Vermont. Um, and she graduated from there in 1949. Um, and she studied um, at Bennington with uh, an artist, Paul Feely, uh, who was head of the department. Um, and it was really through him that she continued her uh, study of uh, thinking about cubism and um, how it uh, kind of flattened space uh, in painting, uh, and also about the history of art. Uh, this is Paul Feely, her instructor, um, who was really instrumental in making Bennington, Vermont, uh, kind of this cultural outpost for the New York art world. Um, so in many ways, it's kind of a, a remote town, but um, Feely really worked diligently to um, put it on the map in terms of, of the art world. Uh, and here's a, one of uh, Feely's um, murals uh, from 1935. Uh, and uh, so you can see some of his interest in kind of simplifying uh, nature. Um, I wanted to show you this uh, later work. This is from 1957. Um, I think it could be argued that the instructor was influenced by the student uh, because uh, this, is, uh, this would have been done five years after Frankenthaler's uh, Mountains and Sea, and it's got that same sort of um, soap stain uh, technique that she had um, pioneer in her painting. After she graduated from uh, Bennington, she uh, organized an exhibition of alumni there in 1950, and she met this man, Clement Greenberg, uh, who is arguably the most um, prominent uh, art critic of the 20th century. He um, was very, uh, a very important writer about uh, the New York School painters um, and a very uh, strong advocate for the idea that uh, painting should emphasize what is specific about painting. That is, it's flat. And so it shouldn't be about illusion of depth, it should be about flatness and abstraction. And so um, those are some of the, the things that, that Greenberg kind of uh, admired in some of the art that was happening around him. He, uh, because of his connections, introduced uh, Frankenthaler to uh, Willem de Kooning, uh, Lee Krasner, and Jackson Pollock, and many others. Um, and in, also, he introduced uh, uh, Frankenthaler to um, Pollock's studio, um, so she visited his, um, his paintings. Um, here's his Lavender Mist from uh, 1950. Um, and of course, Pollock was already working on the floor. Pollock, um, here's an image of him uh, working. Um, he was uh, doing this, and um, so in many ways, Frankenthaler was influenced by his laying the canvas flat on the floor and working uh, from above instead of at an easel from uh, in front of the easel. Um, but Pollock um, was, um, you know, and he was pouring his paint, but it was not. Um, diluted in the same way that Frankenthaler diluted hers, and so it, it sits up on top of the canvas. And um, even in like in lavender mist, um, if you see this painting um, at the National Gallery in Washington, uh, the, the strands of paint form kind of a, a web that you can kind of see that sits on top of the, the canvas surface. Unlike uh, Frankenthaler's paintings, where the, the paint is soaking directly into the canvas and really emphasizing the flatness uh, of the canvas. So um, Frankenthaler is you know, meeting uh, you know, these important people, becoming part of this uh, circle of uh, New York artists. Uh, and um, Greenberg also encouraged her to study with Hans Hoffman, a uh, very influential uh, teacher and painter um, who uh, emphasized um, 
the dynamism of color in abstract painting. One of his um, famous um, dictums was a push pull, in that you know color could kind of give us the sense of of, of moving forward, moving back, this kind of sense of movement uh, in an abstract painting. Um, and so Frankenthaler studied briefly with Hoffman uh, in 1950 in Provincetown, uh, Massachusetts. This is about the, the same time that Hoffman is in uh, Provincetown um, to give a talk about post-abstract uh, painting, um, which was part of a, an exhibition that included Pollock and Mark Rothko and many other uh, important painters at the time. So kind of all these influences are coming together by 1950 um, to uh, really have quite an impact on Frankenthaler. And so, you know, a couple years later in 1952, she creates um, Mountains and Sea, uh, this very pivotal painting for her. Um, and I think, oh, and I wanted to, um, you know, again, this, this technique is called soak stain. Um, but I, I wanted to also emphasize that like Hoffman, um, Frankenthaler believed in kind of the dynamism of color and the sense of it kind of moving. Um, and here she says, color can be beautiful in terms of how it moves, yet it remains in place. If color doesn't move in space, it is only decorative. So that was one of the things that she was perhaps influenced by Hoffman in, uh, but it became a really important part of her uh, painting and her approach to painting. I wanted to show you a brief clip of her that I think may be unfortunately a little hard to uh, hear, but it just gives you a, a chance to maybe get a sense of what she's talking about this time. picture that 
is beautiful or comes off or works looks as if it all was made in one stroke at once. I myself don't like to see the trail of a brush stroke, the drip of paint. To me, that's part of a kind of sentiment or cluing in that has nothing to do with how a picture hits you. Is it hard to do one of the well, I think the first issue is uh, being a painter. she was saying was really important in terms of you know, not having that evidence of the, of the brush, of uh, the idea of you know, working on this um, cotton duck and having um, the, un the unpainted areas just as important as the painted areas. Um, I love her, the uh, discussion at the end where the interviewer asks um, if it's difficult being a woman and an artist. She didn't want to be referred to as a woman artist. Um, and she was, I think it's important to note that she was um, gaining prominence in a very male dominated art world at this time. Um, and that um, she really was one of the first artists to kind of uh, shed that idea of just being uh, referred to as a woman artist. Uh, so we've kind of looked at how. Um, you know, she was influenced by, by some others and what kind of led to her being a rule breaker. I wanted to also look at uh, some of her influence on other artists. Uh, in 1953, uh, Greenberg brought a couple of painters, uh, Morris Lewis, whose work we see here, and Kenneth Noland, who we'll see in just a second, uh, brought them to Frankenthaler's studio in 1953 so that they could see what she was doing uh, with her soak stain technique and her use of color. Uh, and they were both uh, extremely influenced by Frankenthaler. Uh, Morris Lewis called her a bridge between Pollock and what was possible. Kenneth Nolan said, we were interested in Pollock but could gain no lead from him. He was too personal. Frankenthaler showed us the way to think about and use color. Uh, and so both of these artists went on to um, become part of this, this movement that Greenberg celebrated with an exhibition that he organized in 1964 at the L.A. County Museum of Art called Post Painterly Abstraction. Uh, and that exhibition included um, uh, Frankenthaler, Morris Lewis, Kenneth Noland, uh, Frankenthaler's teacher, Paul Feely, that she had had at, at Bennington, uh, and 27 other artists. And each of the artists was represented by three works uh, in this exhibition. Clement Greenberg defined post-painterly abstraction as being linear in design, bright in color, uh, lacking in any sort of realistic detail or abstract, open in composition, often with your eye being led off of the, the canvas, and anonymous in execution. In other words, there's no sense of the brush stroke that color is soaking uh, directly into the canvas. So here we see another work by Frankenthaler from 1964, the same year that this exhibition took place, called Small's Paradise. And here we are back to Head of the Meadow from 1967. Uh, so done just a few years after that 64 exhibition, uh, very much part of this uh, movement that Frankenthaler is now kind of seen as, as initiating this post-painterly abstraction movement, also often referred to as color field painting because of the emphasis on these large, expansive uh, fields of color in the, in the artist's work. But I wanted to uh, think really quickly how, um, how Frankenthaler's Head of the Meadow is similar to but yet different from Head of the Meadow, uh, from Mountains and Sea, her breakthrough painting of 1952. Um, so you might have noticed that in, in Mountains of the Sea, there's a lot of um, 
a lot of emphasis on line and where she's actually used charcoal to create a lot of these, these lines that you see in the painting, kind of the sense of drawing and then the application of paint. Um, we don't see those uh, that same kind of use of charcoal um, here in Head of the Meadows, and there's much more of an emphasis on these bigger planes of, of color. Um, also, of course, the color itself is different. Um, in Mountains and Sea, we have a much um, more pale, pastel use of color. Um, Frank Dollar talked about the fact that you know, this was influenced by a trip to Nova Scotia. She had just been doing watercolors prior to uh, creating Mountains and Sea. And so she was really trying to replicate the same effect of watercolors um, in an oil painting uh, by diluting the paint uh, down with turpentine um, so that it's soaked into the canvas. Um, in Head of the Meadow, we see a, a much more brilliant use of color. Um, this perhaps could be this shift in coloration could have been the result of uh, Frankenthaler being accused early on of using feminine colors with these uh, paler colors in mountains and sea. Uh, but we see a much uh, more bright, um, brilliant use of color uh, in Head of the Meadow. Uh, in a 1971 interview, uh, Frankenthaler was asked how she would define a successful painting for herself. Uh, and she said, I don't think one can describe that. I think you have to stand in front of it and feel it. But part of that feeling involves certain elements of space and light, scale, the moment caught. Um, so I hope everybody, um, after we conclude, will have a, uh, some time to go out and stand in front of uh, uh, Head of the Meadow and um, uh, kind of get a sense of that um, with this painting. It's part of the thing about these very large scale paintings. And uh, something to point out about Mountains and Sea, too, is the fact that that painting is like, I think it's like seven by 10 feet. So it, you know, these are very large scale paintings. And so um, as a viewer, we kind of relate to that scale uh, much more differently than a, a smaller uh, scale painting. In 1969, uh, Helen Frankenthaler had her first retrospective exhibition at the Whitney Museum of Art. This is an uh, image of the catalog uh, that came out with that exhibition. So she was just 41 years old at this time that she had her first retrospective. So I guess that shouldn't be surprising when you have your breakthrough painting at, 20, at just under 24 that you would have a retrospective at 41. Um, it's, uh, it was quite a lot of accomplishment at a very early age. Uh, Frankenthaler went on to have a you know extensive, a successful career until her death in 2011 after an illness. Um, and this is a, a quote from Jerry Saltz um, from her uh, from an article he wrote uh, after she uh, died. Um, again, emphasizing um, how she broke rules, how how innovative she was. He said, "It's easy to forget how radical it was for an artist." to let go of structure, forsake known geometries, stop using the side of the painting to define the image, move away from enclosed forms and meld background and image, all while enthralling the eye, enticing the mind, and allowing others to use the work as a passage to a not quite known imaginary place. And I think we can certainly see in this very brief look at the work of Frankenthaler that she did uh, allow others to use her work uh, as a passage to this uh, not quite known place, uh, such as Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland and others who were influenced uh, by her innovative use of the soap stain technique. Uh, which kind of takes us back to that uh, earlier uh, quote about you know, there being no rules. Um, that's certainly what uh, Frankenthaler's work was all about from her, her breakthrough in 1952. Uh, was really ignoring the rules and uh, embarking on her own artistic innovation. Wanted to point out, um, I know we're just a little over time, um, that um, this series of talks is really kind of a prelude to the opening of our fall exhibition, uh, which opens on October 3rd, called Macrocosm, Microcosm, Abstract Expressionism in the American Southwest. Uh, and um, so that exhibition will open for our next uh, Art Afternoon uh, talk. Uh, and their, the opening reception will be on the evening of Thursday, October 2nd. Um, there will be a member's preview at 6 p.m. 
uh, a lecture by the uh, exhibition curator Mark White at 7 p.m. and then a public reception from uh, the conclusion of the lecture until 9 p.m. So I encourage you all to um, to um, attend uh, that uh, opening of the exhibition. It'll be a, a wonderful show. Uh, and then our next um, our afternoon talk will actually focus on, on this painting uh, that you see here uh, included in this exhibition. And that, um, I'm trying to remember if I can remember the exact date. Um, I should have my calendar. Um, it's, um, I think, October 21st, Tuesday, October 21st, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but um, we will continue thinking about abstract expressionism by looking at examples of work that are actually included in this exhibition. The Frankenthaler will not be part of this exhibition. As I mentioned, it, it's on loan to the museum and will probably be leaving by the end of October. Um, but I uh, just kind of thought it was a, a good uh, discussion as we're thinking about abstract expressionism because she was certainly part 